Not to be like the world and not to be like the great majority of American Christians, but to be like Jesus Christ. I don't know why you're clapping. I'm talking about you. What's wrong with you people? I'm serious. You can't say amen. You ought to say ouch. Hello, Humblebees. Welcome to Tulips and Honey. Welcome back, Humblebees. Welcome to Tulips and Honey. I am your host, Lauren Herford, and today I am joined by a very special guest, David Knight from Exposit the Word. David, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, hey, Lauren. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm really excited to speak to you today. Thank you. Oh, I am just absolutely thrilled. Of course, any chance that I get to um, ask somebody on that has a cool accent, I, I usually do that. Um, unless they're just massively heretical, then I then I yeah. try to take the opportunity. But you're not massively heretical, actually. So you are um, you've got a wonderful podcast, a YouTube channel, and but like is, is Facebook? This isn't on the list. I've already done it. I'm sorry. But Facebook is like really huge for you guys. Is that where you started from? Yeah. No. Do you know why? It's, yeah. So you're right. It is. It is our probably our most popular um, platform. Um, and the one that's at most risk of being censored <laughs> as well. Right. Yeah. yeah. So we can talk about that later. But um, we spend quite a lot of money on boosting posts on Facebook. Um, so over the last 12 months, I've probably spent about £5,000, which is maybe, I don't know, $6,000. Um, so every time that we post, and we've just been growing our um, subscriber uh, you know, base from there. So we've got about 45,000 followers on on Facebook. So, yeah. Wow. In, in just a year? Did you say a year? Yeah, in about a year. That's right. Wow. Yeah. Praise God. That is wonderful. That is just such great news. Those boost things are kind of neat. So, I mean, I'm, my little $5 budget that I have is is probably not much comparison, but they're cool to do anyways. And I have a lot of fun clicking that little button. And, and yeah, boost absolutely. <laughs> so, um, before we get into too much detail about how awesome all the stuff is that you're doing, do you mind walking us through your testimony and uh, letting the listeners know a little bit more about you? Yeah, of course. Do you want the short version of a long version, Lauren? Well, we prefer here to do at least four-hour interviews. So if you could give the long version, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> so um, I was raised in a, a really broken home um, in London. Um, it was a, a blended family. Um, my mum was a Jehovah Witness, although she had dabbled in Christianity before that. My dad was going to a Baptist church. Um, it was one of those families where they were staying together for the for the kids' benefit. Um, so it was, it was really hard being brought up in that environment. Um, but we used to go to church um, on a Sunday morning. I used to go along with my dad. I think they felt sorry for me. So they encouraged me to come along by saying that I could play the drums. I couldn't even play the drums. So I, I really apologize. If anyone's listening to it, I had to pull up with it on a Sunday morning. I've got no idea of what that sounded like. But they let me play the drums um, and I was going along. I didn't no Jesus I, I wasn't saved back then I, I was just literally going along to make a lot of noise in that drum in that drum kit yeah, um, that's a great way to get kids to go yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's true and um so as we got older um my my family just sort of kind of you, you know was still in this hostile environment and then about 15 years ago my dad was just the best man in the world he was an amazing guy and then he got a brain tumor um his sister died a couple of years before of a brain tumor um and then he got ill in december and then died in in april and he was like my best friend in the world like mm -hmm. he loved him to bits and um at that point i hadn't really I, on a day-to-day -day basis i wasn't thinking about god jesus christianity my faith at all it wasn't you know going through my mind all i was bothered about at that time was um i was a bit of an entrepreneur and i just wanted to become as rich as possible um running my own business and, and focusing on my own little world. Um, and then out of the blue, I just got his phone call. My dad had his seizure um, and, you know, he he had to go into hospital. Um, and then for those next couple of months, I guess I started asking all of those questions that a lot of people do. Oh, why is God allowing this to happen? And, you right. know, because he, he was, you know, still strong in his faith. Although he wasn't very outgoing as a, you know, he wasn't very evangelical. He was very... Um, you know, he, he he had strong faith. And so I was just really questioning everything at that point. And then when he died a few months later, I just completely um, went a bit crazy at that time. And I threw myself, my way of reacting to that was just to completely throw myself into work. So um, I just started working all the hours, all the days. I just become a workaholic and just my, my 
my idol was just to make as much money as possible. Um, and we had three little boys as well. My poor wife was trying to raise, you, you know, our sons whilst I was going to work. And I was almost making myself, um, giving myself peace about that situation by buying them all the designer clothes and, sure, you know, the sure. latest games and stuff. But I really, my, I was just, and that was my way of kind of almost grieving. Like I didn't give myself a second from a day after the funeral. I was just working ridiculous right. hours. Um, and I got to a part so far from the Lord and probably my family as well, if I'm honest. And Lauren, um, like I used to actually enjoy, we had some friends um, who used to come around every now and again that was, was Christians. And I used to really enjoy just late at night after we'd have a takeaway or whatever, just asking them questions and really putting them in the corner, asking them really difficult questions with point, really jagged, pointed questions, you know, <laughs> how can there be a God? Watching, almost enjoying watching them squirm. Um, and I was just really, really against God. And because of how our business was, and I probably had a lot of guilt for the fact that I wasn't at home, i become really private. So I didn't even have a lot of friends that I was wanting to talk to about because I didn't want to talk about my dad and stuff. So just work, work, work. I had employees, but it was all about that. So we then got into a situation where the business become quite successful um, and we had lots of employees and, and we was making a little bit of money. And you can look, it's so funny, isn't it? Because you can't see God in things at the time. Right. Now I have gone through that and I look back, you can just see God's fingerprints on everything. And I just thought, like most people who are, running a successful business I just thought oh, this is going to happen this will just continue like this forever right we're always going to make money and we 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 didn't and and God just started closing doors and before you know it the business just become got to a point where it was going to have to just be broken up and, and I was gonna have to do something else so during that time I then had a couple of months to think about what I was going to do um, and my excuse to not going to family things or not going to do see things with families was always the fact that I was going to have to do some work, right? So mm. my wife was walking the dog um, and she was um, as against God at that time as well, Lauren. And she phoned me at work once and said, oh, I've just met a lady whilst I was walking the dog. And she, I told her a little bit about what, what problems we've got. And she offered to pray for me at the end. Mm. And I mean, to, to show you where I was with the Lord, um, it's it almost like somebody had offered you know, put a, 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 a magic uh, spell on her, like a witchcraft <laughs> spell. I was just like, what are you doing? Like thinking he's just going to, you know, I can't believe, I couldn't believe it. I didn't almost didn't want to look at my wife when I got home from work. Bearing in mind that the business was closing down at this point, I had nowhere to go. A couple of days later, she said, offered for us to go around their house for dinner. And honestly, Lauren, I was the most anti-social guy in the world. Like if ever, there was, and you know, I did not want to be going around anyone's house with it. <laughs> I didn't want to be talking to anyone. But right. my excuse always before was I've got all this work to do. So I had an office to go to. I had workers to, to go and see. But now the business has closed down. I had nowhere to go. I had no excuse. So I was begrudgingly, I was like, ah, oh, okay, well, I'll go. But and I remember saying to my boys, these, this lovely couple who were Christians live just literally across the road from us. I remember saying to them en route to go to the mill, I was saying to my kids, whatever you do, just eat the dinner. Don't have pudding. I'll buy you a McFlurry from McDonald's on the way home. I don't <laughs> go to the drive-thru. Don't, don't, you know, don't ask any questions. Just let's get out of there as quickly as possible, whatever you do. <laughs> so we got there and man, who I, I've never seen either of these guys before. He answered, well, just remember, I mean, even this is how bad it was, Lauren. Even walking up to the drive with the kids, I was saying to them, remember, whatever you do, let's get out of there. Hour and we'll get out of there. They, they, we sat down, we had the meal. They didn't particularly, they spoke, with, they said grace before, you know, gave thanks for the food. They didn't particularly um, speak about their faith very much during the, the meal. But enough for me to, when I got home, um, it left a little stone in my shoe. But I was like, there's something different about those guys. Wow. Um, and it's so funny because I remember I was, I was enjoying their company so much. And bearing in mind, I hadn't done this for years in terms of going around strangers' houses. <laughs> I remember they said, oh, well, I've made a nice pavlova. And suddenly all three of my sons looked at me. <laughs> so I remember giving them the signal with my eyes, like, yeah, no, it's okay. <laughs> like, we'll have put in. And so I got home. And again, how, you know, we know that we've got a sovereign God. Before that, you know, a couple of months beforehand, um, I use my inbox, Lauren, like a to-do list. I don't know if you do as well with my email in inbox. And oh, yeah. If ever I've got more than 10 emails in my inbox, I get a little bit OCD and I start panicking a little bit about that, right? So somebody about six months before that, that evening when we had the meal, 
they sent, I, I guess it was my party trip. Whenever I did have to go to a family thing, I'd, I'd say, oh, I, you know, I'm so busy with work, blah, 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 blah. Same story all the time, you know. <laughs> and um, this guy, he's Elizabeth's cousin, said, oh, okay, I've got this preach um, from this Christian guy, but he's also a very successful businessman. It'd be, you know, I, I'd really recommend that you listen to it. Now, it was Bill Highballs. Now, I wouldn't ever recommend anybody who's listening <laughs> to Highballs now. Right, right. It shows sure. you how the Lord can use things, right? Because I left, I didn't obviously know any anything about Christianity at the time, but I left it in my inbox just in case anybody would if ask me about that preach, I'd feel bad. So I thought I'd leave it in there. And if he ever questions me about it, I can quickly listen to it and then yeah. get back to him. Right, um, right. We came back from that evening um, and I said to Elizabeth, I oh, something different about them. And bearing in mind, I then had a couple of months whilst I was finding another job. I started listening to um, this sermon series by Bill Hybels, but very quickly, thankfully, how YouTube works with the algorithm, it comes up, if you like this, you're going to like this. And before you know it, it started leading me into some, you know, good teaching. And, and oh, um, the amazing thing then, Lauren, I'll try and speed up, because I know you said your four-hour show, this is now gonna, on track for about seven hours if I don't speed up. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> but amazingly, um, during those three months, I just became, um, I got to a point where all of my questions one by one were just being answered. Like, and I just felt my heart defrosting. And when I realized it was all real, Lauren, honestly, like, I remember we was in a different house back then. I remember just getting on the end of my bed and just crying and just feeling so ashamed of how I've been with God and like feeling so dirty about how I've been. Um, and it's just the most amazing, amazing moment of my life, just pr- not knowing how to pray. But I remember just <laughs> praying and saying, God, like, I know you are real. I'm so sorry. Like, and it's so funny, Lauren, right? because in those three months, um, I, everybody had been telling me at, during that time, obviously not, not with Christian friends and stuff, ah, oh, you know, I've been watching all of these box sets. And at that time, it was things like Breaking Bad and Walking Dead. Mm-hmm. And there was all of these different box sets that people had said that they'd been watching, but I hadn't because I'd been working. So my plan during those three months was to just binge watch all of these different box sets that people have been suggesting, yeah. order dominoes every day while the kids are at school yeah. and watch like six hours worth of TV. And I remember in that prayer when I realized that God was real and, and obviously I didn't understand the gospel at that point, but I just knew that there was a creator of the universe and I wasn't right with him. Um, I remember just praying in that prayer saying, oh God, like this, this um, hunger that I've got for, um, wanting to watch these box sets over the next few months. Can you replace that with wanting to learn about you? Um, wow. And just amazing. Honestly, Lauren, for the next couple of months, I was just five, six, seven hours a day watching all of these different wow. uh, <laughs> sermons. But the amazing thing is, again, God uses everything. A lot of those people were terrible, terrible yeah. teachers yeah. who I wouldn't touch in a million years now. And, right. um, and this is one of the reasons, I, you know, I've heard you obviously speak when you came on to Exposit the Word. Um, God, God uses all this stuff, right? And then I, ha- I actually got a job that I was commuting. It was a four-hour round, round trip every day. Wow. Um, so I and I done that for about a year. So I was downloading all of these podcasts, listening to um, people, and how I didn't know who was good, who was bad. I didn't even know there was false teachers. I just thought if you was Christian, mm-hmm. if you was on iTunes and you was in the Christian podcast, you must be a Christian, so it's going to be safe, right? So right. for four hours a day for a year. I was listening, so I went to the top of the charts and was like, oh, the top three or four people, Joyce Meyer, Joel Osteen, Bethel, you know, you can imagine, right? <laughs> so I was, I, was be, I was marinating for four hours a day, <laughs> living my best life now in the car. <laughs> I am wonderful. I am fearfully made. Like, <laughs> not, not understanding the Bible in any way, but just, just you know. And then, uh, information, sure. Yeah, yeah. And then... Um, it, it finally got to the point where where it wasn't really matching up. You know, there was no category for trials. Uh, we started going to a, a, a church nearby um, where it's a charismatic church and, and, you know, they had wonderful worship music, but the teaching, I, I just wasn't growing in terms of any biblical knowledge. We It was a massive church. We didn't, this is when we first become saved. I didn't, we wasn't fellowshipping with anybody, wasn't growing in our Bible knowledge. And we, uh, it wasn't expository teaching it was topical teaching and it was no category for trials so we'd go there and from the front the, the the leader would be saying oh everyone can feel the holy spirit here right now everyone's amazing this was every week and we were sitting there with all of these different things going in our lives going 
why isn't this happening? Like, what's, <laughs> there's a mismatch going on here, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> there's no category for 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 that, you know, as part of that sanctification. Yeah. So that's kind of where it all started. Um, wow. Still didn't understand the gospel at that point, but that kind of come on a little bit later on in the journey. How did your wife react to that whenever you, when you first started all of this? Was she right there with you or was she a little bit resistant? No, Lauren, that's one of the amazing things about, about our journey. So um, all, my, my three boys, my wife and I, we've, we've just, um, God's just been so kind to us. We've just all absorbed and been on this journey together. Um, wow. We now home educate our boys. Um, and we start off every day with a Bible study. We read a chapter together. We finish the day with a Bible chapter. And um, they're hungry. They, they, they're they growing every day as well. And we're, we're so blessed to, to be on this journey together. Because I know that's not the same case for everybody, right? And sure. we're, we're so thankful for that. Wow, that is so neat. That's really encouraging to hear, really. Um, not something that, that you do hear very often. But it is it is one of the reasons why I love to ask this question, because I feel like, you know, I can tell you the exact day, but somebody else might not be able to, or somebody else might have a spouse that leaves them over this. And, yeah. and I have heard from people like that. And so I think it's helpful to hear all of these different perspectives, because God individually loves and, and cares for and sanctifies each and every one of his children in this beautiful, unique way that is, it really is glorifying to God. So I appreciate you sharing that with the, with the listeners. That was, wow. I mean, just when, do you still have the four hour drive now? And if so, do you still, do you still get to listen to all those podcasts? Uh, Lauren, do you know what? I've got a four step journey to work. Now. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's um, I'm a, I'm a, way better. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a website designer, um, so I can still oh. listen to sermons all day long as I'm building websites or doing expositor word, which takes up a lot of time as well. But yeah, yeah. I don't have that journey, thankfully. <laughs> right, that's crazy. The the gas prices and stuff that just uh, yeah, yeah, and the time that takes for sure. Um, so, but speaking of expositor the word, you mentioned it takes a lot of your time. What, when did you decide to to do this, and and how did you go about putting all of this together? Because this is this is a huge undertaking. Like just the one episode that I do a week is several hours right throughout the week, but you've got a lot of stuff going on and very well organized and put together just tremendously well. So can you walk us through a little bit of how that, that got started? Yeah. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so much of it, I, I know people will hear this sometimes and they'll go, oh, you know, being modest or whatever, but I know you know this to be true. Like none of this at all is done in my own strength. Like I'm a bumbling idiot. Like you know, <laughs> I barely know how to put, you know, I, I make websites for a living. I'm average at that. You know, <laughs> God, you know, God has just put his hand on it and, and opened and closed so many doors and just led it amazingly. And we're so grateful for it. So if you, if you ask me how it's happened, then, I can tell you from what I've experienced in it, Lauren, in terms of what he's done. Like, um, we started it off um, and created it as something called Social Church. Um, and the reason why, I, and the whole point of it at that point was, I realised the power in testimonies. Um, I know there's a lot of people that will, um, and I think it's because of my testimony in terms of how I kind of was before. If I would have listened to a friend or somebody I trusted tell me of their experience, it would have had more credibility than listening to somebody who I don't know read the Bible right. or, you know what I mean, or read a Bible that I don't even know is God's word at that point. I don't, why, you know, sure. yeah, you're saying this is true. Who knows if that's true? So yeah. I knew the power of testimonies. And my, my, because I knew how to build websites, I thought, oh, it'd be a really good idea for just everyday normal Christians who haven't got a public platform, who don't normally get interviewed by anybody. So I always use my wife as an example. So she would do the school run. She'd know, you know, she'd have three or 400 friends on Facebook and she would go into the school playground and people would know that she goes to church. I know she's a Christian, but you know what it's like, Lauren, when you've got kids, we wasn't home educating back then. <laughs> you know, you go there, the kids were running around everywhere. Your conversations are like in three minute chunks, yeah. right? There's no That's opportunity. <laughs> like, you know. yeah. I'd often say to my wife, she'd go out with someone for lunch. I'd say, oh, did you get to talk about this? And I'd be like, oh no, like, yeah. Like, it's a whole reason you went, you know. <laughs> she didn't. But so I thought, well, there's a lot of power that if I was to record people's testimonies where they'd be interviewed by me, they would talk about how they were saved, but finish every single testimony with, if you've heard my story today and you don't know Jesus yourself, and then break down the gospel for them and yeah. let them know the, the gospel presentation. So, and then my my intention was that we would then put that on our Facebook page 
um, and then they would then share it from the Facebook page onto their own profile. And then people would, their friends would then be intrigued going, oh, why has she been interviewed? And then you've got a captive audience. You're then listening to someone for 20 minutes or whatever, or seven yeah. hours in my case. <laughs> talk, about, <laughs> <laughs> talk about their testimony, hearing the gospel. And, and, and it was just amazing. And then we did that. And then I, I'm a massive fan of John MacArthur and the guys at Grace to You. So we, we started up a Twitter channel and I think Phil Johnson liked one of our testimonies. I can't remember how it quite happened, but I then, I then reached out to Phil Johnson and on Twitter and just said to him, oh, like, um, would you record your testimony? Um, and because of a time difference, um, about six hours later, it was like one or two o'clock in the morning in UK time, I was in bed. Um, Phil Johnson said, oh, yeah, sure, I think I can do it tomorrow at three o'clock. Like, he, he can come or whatever. <laughs> Honestly, Lauren, I I didn't sleep a wink that night. You can imagine. Right. I'm like, what? <laughs> so, <laughs> just amazing. And then Phil Johnson then um, recorded, amazing, lovely man, so supportive. Um, and then when he then retweeted it, because I think he's got like 40,000, maybe 45,000 Twitter followers, all of a wow. sudden we just started growing a little bit of momentum and lots of people then wow. wanted to do their testimony. Um, and then we found that we was getting a lot of traffic onto this website that I'd built. Um, and then people started asking questions, like the questions that we would ask before we were Christians and even questions we'd ask now, like, you know, were there dinosaurs really? Or, you know, <laughs> like, why does God bad things to happen? And what I wanted to do is because I had these people onto the website and they was hearing a gospel presentation, like people's friends and stuff, I was thinking, well, what do we do now with them? I want to point them to sound resources and stuff. But um, as I started interviewing people that did have a public profile, um, like an author, and then we'd record some apologetic questions with them. Um, and then that grew. So then people were on our website and then they were able to, you know, have these questions answered by people that knew what they were talking about as well at the same time. That's so cool. That's great. So that that's how it started. Now you guys have um, expository preaching on there and and your website is really cool. I like I mean, the way that it's all designed and stuff is is very cool that it's really amazing to me what you're talking about with the the testimonies and how you mentioned the gospel because you actually have on your website that a million people have heard the gospel from your channel yeah. Yeah. that is that is wonderful have you guys seen any fruit or heard from anyone um about that yeah that's that is incredible isn't it um so that's for our youtube channel um because we embed the videos onto our website and then it's probably a million on facebook as well that have that have heard um, our videos um we do get a lot of people reaching out um from, from an encouraging point of view um so now this is i'm doing this bible study at the moment with a certain person with a bible in hand following along so that's that's their lovely messages to receive wow. get quite a lot of messages from people that have said look i've been listening to this type of preaching and it's made me realize that i'm going to a church that doesn't um, wow have teaching like this and then they ask if i know of any churches which is quite hard for us to signpost people to sound churches so there's lots of websites like the nine marks guys and acts 29 where right. we can point people towards and then ligonier had a great um, facility called ask ligonier as well i don't know if you know about that lauren and oh i did not uh, i'm gonna write that so, down yeah so it's like a live chat service where people can go on there and basically ask somebody who's trained um, in theology to be able to uh, you know answer any question that they've got so we get a lot of questions come through on Facebook and be, because there's quite a lot of, and it's only me doing it and it's, it's not really my job. I just don't have time to respond to like 20 or 30 of these messages and give nice. Bible verses to support it. So I signpost people towards Ligonier. Um, nice. Yeah, that's, that's been an encouragement. That is, that is really, really neat. I, I mean, the, is the messaging stuff you mentioned, if you have too many things on your, on your email that it gets a little concerning. And I'm like that too is the amount of social media messaging and stuff, is it overwhelming at times? How do you deal with that? It, Lauren, it really is, but I don't want to be ungrateful, like, you know, because I'm so blessed to be in this um, situation. But it really, I mean, I have seasons. I, God's blessed me with, like, a really good work ethic. And I know I was com talking about that when I used it in the wrong way before to, to try and become <laughs> rich. But, you know, some quite often I've been in a season for the last six months where, you know, sometimes I'm sleeping for like four or five hours a day and working <laughs> because, you know, work and then obviously exposing the word. I probably spend more time doing that than I do my actual job. Um, so, yeah, it is quite it is very, very time consuming. Um, and we're always coming up with new ideas because, like, for an example, we, we wanted to record some classic sermons that I think you know about. Yes, um, I love those. Yeah. And I put out a tweet just saying, no, oh, because I, I recorded a few, but I, I 
I'm basically a facilitator. I, I don't. I'm not a great talker, as this is an evidence of. You know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I recorded a few, and people seem to like them. The idea of it, anyway. Not maybe. Not maybe, maybe not the delivery. Um, so I just put out a tweet saying, "Oh, if anybody wants to record any classic sermons for us, then that'd be like really helpful." And I think we got like over fifty, maybe f- nearly sixty people that reached out to us. Um, oh. And they're all being recorded as we speak now. So obviously the manuscripts have gone out and they've come back in again. And these people have like blessed us by saying, oh, look, I'll do this on a regular basis. So from a content point of view, you know, that's just another thing that we're having to put together now, as well as like the author interviews and obviously the expository preaching and the other stuff that we do as well. Yeah, that's a lot. There's a lot, a lot of stuff going on on your channel, which is fantastic because um, we're all getting to be blessed by that. But it's also wonderful to see that the church is working together and social media, especially Twitter, gets a really bad name and it deserves the bad names it gets. Mm-hmm. But it is also nice to see it being used in this way, in this positive way where people are uh, being able to come together and help you and, and record those things. So do you still need volunteers? Should we do like a quick shout out for that or are you good? Always. Yeah. Always up for volunteers um, for, for reading sermons um, because it's just such a, you know, it's an, an infinite amount of classic sermons out there that we're going to be able to work through, right, Lauren? So yeah, yeah that's true. Absolutely. Okay, so how should they reach you if they're gonna if they want to help with that? Uh, so you could email me um, info at expositeforword.com. That'd be really great. Um, thank you very much, Lauren. And as you know, I've, I've got an OCD about the inbox, so I'm going to probably reply to you within like an hour or two of you sending the email. <laughs> with. Just don't reply too often to me because it's going to stress me out. <laughs> 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 yeah, don't just send an okay and a smiley face, okay? So that, that, that's not a thing that we should do. I do get really nervous if it ticks up too far, then I start avoiding looking at my phone because I'm like, oh, I don't yeah. have enough time to look at these things. And But yeah, no, um, I, that's really, really great. I'll make sure to link to that information in the uh, descriptions below in case any of you guys want to help with that because that is really, really cool. If any of you have like a Morgan Freeman voice too, volunteer, okay? Don't that keep your good. voice to yourself. Just yeah, that would be, be good. Thoughtful, yeah. <laughs> if yeah. you have a really deep, low voice, and you can do that, that'd be great. But <laughs> you mentioned expository preaching, which is uh, as a false convert in the Word of Faith, and even for the first like two years of being a Christian, I had no idea that that was a thing or what it meant, yeah. or that topical sermons were a thing or what that meant. So, um, can you explain what that is and why it's uh, so important? Yeah, of course. So, expository preaching in the UK is is, is quite a hard thing to find. Um, in terms of what you're looking for is the expositor, the person who's teaching will will do three things. They will read the text, they'll explain the text, and then they'll, they'll apply the text. Um, so it's all about making sure that it's delivered within its own context. So when they read the text, they're paying um, special attention as to what the verses are around that scripture that they're teaching from. It's very important. So as an example, Steve Lawson, who's an amazing um, expository preacher, as you know, Lauren, he'll always say that if, it's, if your verse starts off with a therefore, you need to know what it's there for. <laughs> you I don't just ignore. Line. Yeah, don't just ignore what's what's because you can get yourself into a real mess if you just take out these Bible verses and you can build a whole theology yeah. around one Bible verse, like we see false teachers do all the time, right? Yeah. Um, so they read the text, then they explain the text using other Bible verses to support and and explain and to um, teach what that text actually means. Um, with two things in mind what the author, the human author actually meant and what it meant to the actual recipient of that letter in its time as well. So we're remembering that, you know, often when we're reading the Bible, we're reading somebody else's mail, right? So it's like, (laughs) what did this actually mean to the person 2000 years ago when they received this letter from Paul as an example? Um, And then when we then bear that in mind, we then are looking for the expositor to then apply the text. So bridging that gap, there's been 2,000 years, you know, to, to preach. What did it actually mean in the context when it was actually written back 2,000 years ago? Oh, that's see, And that's so helpful, too, to get to hear all of that stuff. There's a lot of big words, I think, whenever we look at Reformed theology and stuff. But expository, that's a big word. There's, you know, we're going to talk about hermeneutics in a second. But one of the things that I try to point out whenever I'm talking about expository preaching or even really just reading God's word at all and, and talking about it is that we don't like to be taken out of context. Yeah. And so um, if we're talking about like the God of the universe, we should probably be even more concerned about taking him out of context. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's why this is so, so helpful and so important. Yeah, it's so true because you, you can literally make the Bible say whatever you wanted it to say, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you think of how the, the prosperity teachers teach, I'll take a Bible verse here, I'll butcher one there. And yeah. for example, I always talk about Psalm 14. You know, it's if you take that out of context, there is no God. And, you know, you right. 
Yes. But, but beforehand, it says devil, according yeah. to his heart says there is no God. But obviously, you know, that's an extreme case of it. But you can literally bend and manipulate the Bible to teach whatever you want and affirm any sin or any lifestyle that you want to live. Yeah, absolutely. And taking it, like you mentioned, out of context is one of the ways that they do that very frequently because the chapter and verses, I know that they're, they're very helpful and I'm glad, but I was blown away as a new believer when I learned that those were not like actually there at the beginning. Oh yeah. That, <laughs> those were added in down the road. I was like, what? These, you mean to tell me these weren't just put in there? Like Jesus wasn't like writing those in there as they were going along. That's crazy. So, um, but speaking of which, what about, um, you just started a new series, which I'm really excited about with hermeneutics. Uh, that's another big word. And I love these big words, but they can get a little intimidating. Yeah. And so that, that is a extremely helpful thing. So can you explain hermeneutics and also a little bit about your new series? Yeah, sure. Well, I can explain it, but I can't spell it, Lauren. Um, <laughs> me neither. Yeah. And it's in front of me, and I still won't. I won't get it right. <laughs> so, hermeneutics is the art and science of biblical interpretation. Um, and how this has all come about is I've I've only um, produced two videos so far, and they've actually people have been really kind about them and said they've been helpful. And I'm not an expert by any stretch of imagination on hermeneutics. How, what how this has um, kind of come to be is. They say that you um, remember or you retain what you teach. And I'm actually, um, I'm signed up with a master's seminary. So with the Institute wow. of Church Leadership. Um, wow. well, I'm actually learning hermeneutics with Abner Chow at the moment. Um, so, cool. so basically, this is an opportunity. And it's all done online, obviously. I'm, unfortunately, I'm not going to California <laughs> each week. <laughs> but um, this is just basically an opportunity for me to absorb what I'm learning. I'm reading lots of books about it at the same time. And then I'm able to then sort of think about it and then, put them into these sort of short seven or eight minute little video chunks um and again it's, it's very linked in with expository preaching because hermeneutics is um what the um the, the expository teacher will very much do before delivering the message it's all about making sure that the um the text that they're going to be teaching is taught within its context so um they pay special attention to the, the grammar um the context like we was mentioning we know that the Bible is a collection of 66 different books. So it's about what kind of genre is the writing um, because you wouldn't write a, you know, you wouldn't read a gospel like you would poetry. And it's about understanding that, understanding where it fits into God's redemptive plan. And then understanding um, and not tripping up over things that aren't, that things that are confusing. So there are lots of things in the Bible that you can read and, and it can make you stumble. And an example that I, what I mentioned well, in the last hermeneutics video that I did, Lauren, was um, a lot of people who are atheists say, oh, well, Jesus said that, but, you know, the faith of the size of a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed at its time. That's not the smallest seed. We've now, with modern day science, found out that there's a seed a thousand times smaller than that. <laughs> um, the hermeneutics is all about Jesus was communicating to a group of people at the time and he was using illustrations that they would understand. Um, <laughs> And obviously, that's the, that's the art of good communication, right? To talk in terms that someone would understand. If Jesus started talking about the the battery of an iPhone back then, obviously, <laughs> we understand it now. But they would have been going, "What are you even talking about?" Like, yeah. do you know what I mean? So you're a madman. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Understanding that, and then feeling almost bridging that gap from us today in 2020, all the way back to when the biblical authors were actually writing the text to the recipients, and to understanding what that meant, so that we don't make any mistakes. Oh yeah, that is such a great example, and uh, and really, I'm gonna I'm gonna link to those those two videos too because um, it's it's impressive to me whenever we deal with hermeneutics. First of all, it sounds kind of dry whenever you first start to listen to it, but then whenever you realize what it's gonna do and you go to the yeah. word, it opens the word up in a way that it's never you you've never seen it before like this when you get started. I can imagine. Um, especially from your perspective, whenever you were um, a non-believer, how angry you were at God, that this would be one of those things that would probably help somebody that's cynical at the time, maybe soften their heart a little bit, that there are people out there, not like the Benny Hens, but people who are genuinely taking these things seriously. And there's a whole science behind it. But um, another thing that you guys do really, really well on your channel, and it's funny, um, I, when I was listening to you with Dwayne, you said you, you listen to him and how he interviews to help you whenever you do new interviews. And I do that too, because Dwayne is a fantastic interviewer. Um, but you you do interviews. You've done some tremendously amazing interviews. Conway and Bayway recently is one that I was really excited about. So can you talk a little bit about your interviews and um, when you're when you're talking to some of these guys, was there anything that stood out to you or personalities that they had that you weren't expecting? 
Uh, yeah, great question. Yeah, it's one of my favourite things to do. I uh, loved having you on last week. You were so much fun. Uh, <laughs> it, I mean, I, we've done 130 because I, I, I thought about that last night. I counted them all up. I don't, time's flown by so quickly. <laughs> um, we've had some amazing people on, like you mentioned, Comrade and Bayway, um, Doreen Virtue. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, we had Christine Getty on, Cole Truman, Barnabas Piper. Um, and it's such a, an amazing blessing to learn so much because um obviously in the prep you're reading their book you're prepping and then you'll get an opportunity to speak to them so it's been an amazing blessing for my growth and 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 hopefully for people that are listening to it as well um there are a couple of surprising interviews that i've done that that were probably not from people that are as well known um that really helped me grow there's a book um when a jew rules for a world and uh, by a guy called joel richardson um it's all about end times eschatology and before reading that book I didn't really understand a lot of the the you know the terminology and and what that actually meant in terms of application pre-millennial post-millennial amillennial and and you know um covenant theology that was a really useful um, book and understanding the history of um anti-semitism and, and and how that impacts us today and god's plan for israel that was an amazing helpful um interview um another one as well which uh, you know, Ryan Peterson, a guy that wrote a book called Judgment of a Nephilim. Um, that was a fantastic book um, because many people, and myself included, before being asked to interview this guy, um, I thought the Nephilim was just a strange little um, couple of verses in Genesis and then right. he left alone. But his study, you know, so much scripture pointing to the Nephilim that are known by other names like Raphaelim and um all the way through to Canaan and Joshua and just seeing this intertwined time and time again, when you just see it keep coming up, there are verses that we would just skim over normally. And this guy, I remember saying it to him when I interviewed him, like a lot of us, when we read a verse in the Bible, we, we go, oh, that's a bit weird. And sometimes <laughs> we almost hurry on to the next one that we could actually engage with and get. Yeah. And this guy was almost like a magnet to, to difficult Bible verses and he wouldn't let anything untangled. And he, he was just an, an amazing um book to read and a really good interview as well but we've been so blessed um lauren with so many great guests lots of the christian publishers and um, work with us and send us over books that are coming out and ask us to interview them and, and yeah it's a real blessing that's really neat well, well i'm gonna have to check out both of those books and i'll make sure to link to those interviews and those books um because i think the nephilim thing is is for sure one of those things that can really attract um non-believers to listen because they're they're sort of fascinated with the, that kind of stuff you know ancient aliens and everything but yeah. it is really cool when you have a podcast that you can just say hey do you want to do you want to come on my podcast and all these people will be like yeah sure why not and that blew me away whenever i began i was like really are you sure because <laughs> I don't have a very big like listenership yet, but yeah, they are. They're all just like, yeah, sure. Why not? Hey, and we'll send you free books if you want to do a giveaway. And yeah. it's really, I'm like, I, how do we get like um, the founders of Apple and stuff to interview so we can get some free stuff there. It's, <laughs> I'm still trying to figure that out. But yeah. <laughs> um, you, you do have some really cool stuff going on on your channel. Do you have any projects or uh, exciting things coming out? Usually whenever I have somebody on the interview, I try to get them to tell me something that they're not going to really be ready to tell anybody yet. So what do you have for me that I can like journalistically drag out of you? <laughs> sure. Well, we've still got 15 <laughs> books left to um, fill from expository, uh, so from expository teaching. So we're we're working hard to fill those. Some of them are huge as well. So, um, for example, the Martin Lloyd Jones Trust gave us permission to use Romans um, for Martin Lloyd Jones, and there's like 360 odd sermons for that. So we're on chapter <laughs> two, of that, but it all takes time to obviously turn it into an MP4 file and mm -hmm. get it published. So that's going to take a little bit of time. God willing, maybe we'll get that done by sort of Christmas time. Um, at the same time, we're going to be doing the classic sermons because of the pre-Christmas um, publishing. Um, a lot of publishers want to get books out before Christmas. Um, I think, Lauren, I think I've got maybe like thirty interviews lined up between now and wow. end of November. So that's going to be busy. But it's like an interview a day. How do you do it? <laughs> no, yeah, it's going to be busy. It's going to be busy. But um. Our plan going forward, um, and we're always on our toes and willing to be flexible to see, you know, what people want us to do. But one of the things I always try and think, what would be useful for me in my Bible study, right? In terms of if I could come to a website and if I'm learning Luke with Jerry Rag as an example, um, and, he, you know, I've got these wonderful sermons, you know, expounding the text and then teaching me. Sometimes I come up against these names of people and I don't actually know who they are and where they fit into the God's redemptive story. So 
our next part of our project is to, to whenever we come up against somebody we've not met in a Bible before, is to do a 10 or 15 minute like little video biography of who they are. So for oh, an example, neat. meet Abraham for, for, you know, first time we meet Abraham, meet Jacob, meet Joseph. And just some of the videos might not be very long if we don't know a lot about the person, but <laughs> just to help us build up a little bit of context and say, ah, oh, okay, well, you know, this guy is actually also mentioned here and that's who they're related to. And this is where they kind of fit into the whole storyline just to help us build our sort of awareness and our context as we as we're reading so that's going to be a project that we're going to be starting next year that we're excited about that is really neat oh I'm so excited about that it's amazed that ministries like yours Lauren because <clears throat> where I'm not particularly clever and it's the reason why we do audio the editing process because we're pushing out quite a lot of volume to be able to edit video and um you know make that look good and I make a lot of mistakes when I'm interviewing people so obviously having audio only and then you can hide a lot more with audio only mm-hmm. yeah. um and you can make yourself sound half intelligent when doing so, you know. But with video, I don't think you can hide it. That's why I'm petrified about doing this with you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, 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 the video side of it is, is is a step that I'd love to be able to do if ever I get better at doing it. Maybe something in the future would be, you know, be an yeah. option. Oh yeah, that's yeah. You're definitely right. The video part, I I fought that for a while too. So I didn't want I didn't want to do it. But once you do it, then you kind of are like out there and you can't really take it back. Yeah. It's like a Pandora's box. So, um, but you're right. Editing is is insane. There's a, a program, and I think it's DaVinci or something like that. Um, and it's supposed to be fantastic and free, but it's like movie grade quality. But there's a hundred hours of lessons before you like to learn how to use it. And I'm yeah. sure like you could probably learn just the basics of it and it would be fine. But I mean, I got so overwhelmed by all the buttons and stuff when I downloaded it that I just, I, I undownloaded it and I was like, I'm going to focus on that later. <laughs> I'll just keep using my iMovie studio right now. And, yeah. but it's cool that they have that available, but um, I'm sorry, we, we scrolled again, but you've been listening to the live event. So, you know, already that that was, that was going to happen. Um, <laughs> so, you uh you do have a lot of older sermons coming on and really I love the uh Martin Lloyd Jones uh stuff going on and everything like that. What um what do you think is important about these older sermons and and why is it important for us to actually listen to these guys that have already gone on to glory? Yeah. Well, we live in a, a world at the moment um unfortunately where the public face of Christianity is is prosperity and it's easy believism, right? And and seeker sensitive. So in a lot of churches, they just refuse to talk about sin <laughs> as an example. And you know, it just takes away the legs of the gospel. How can you talk to somebody about needing a savior if they don't know that they need to be saved? Saved from what? And you know, the, the truth is there are people that have been going to church for 20 years and, and don't understand the gospel and they don't understand that they're a sinner because they're not hearing it. They're hearing the same messages week in, week out that, you know, Jesus died so, and, and God is almost like this grandpa figure that wants to bless them. And, and, and you know, and it's, yeah. it's disturbing. And I think what we get with a lot of the older sermons is, is we get an unfiltered truth from them yeah. um, and an urgency. There's no um, time spent on making people feel comfortable in terms of there's no entertainment. There's no tickling ears often. They, right. they, you know, often from the first or second sentence, you know, you're already in deep territory and, you know, <laughs> you know, and I just love that because we, 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 we need that voice at the moment. If we need, a, we need people to wake up. Yeah. Um, and I think these sermons do a really good job of doing that, Lauren. They definitely do. I love that answer too. Cause as you know, we we talked about this whenever uh, you interviewed me that I was in church for like 15 years and I never heard the gospel or anything of importance at all. It was just, it was just a waste of time really. Um, I mean, God can use uh, all these things, but it is nice to have the, the ability to go to your channel and find these, these awesome, wonderful older sermons. So in that line of reasoning, who is your favorite preacher throughout history and which one of them would you want to interview if you could bring them back? Uh, well he's still alive it'd be john MacArthur. Um, oh wouldn't that be so neat you've got any connection scary to make it happen. yeah <laughs> uh, i know that, right yeah. i feel like i should put that information out to all of my listeners if you guys know him then you yeah. just let us know. <laughs> that would be so Reach good um, yeah. yeah would you be nervous though to talk to him to interview him Oh, of course. I'm nervous to speak to anybody. So yeah, John McCarthy. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> There'd probably be quite a lot of editing afterwards, but I'm sure he'd be patient and gracious and forgive my stuttering and <laughs> my words. <laughs> Most of my I... guests have been, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, you did a wonderful job interviewing me. It was really, really fun. I, I really, I would absolutely just love to even just get to shake his hand. Um, California is kind of far away from us. We've only been there a couple of times, but right now it's also on fire. So we're going to avoid that area until, um, until it stops being on fire. Maybe we can send some of the snow that we're getting here, but it would be cool just to go. I had a friend drive all the way from Texas just to see him. And he was sick that day. <laughs> he didn't oh, make, God. he wasn't able to, to preach, but she got to see some other really cool people preach anyways. But um Okay, so let's see here. What then is the theologian that's had the most impact on your life? Okay, great question. Um, Sinclair Ferguson um, is amazing, isn't he? Um, yeah. A book that's made a, a made a really big difference to me. I only read it about a year and a half ago. Um, was for Whole Christ, um, and it was about the uh, Marrow controversy in Scotland. Uh, I don't know if you've you've read this book, Lauren, or if your listeners mm-hmm. have, but it was a book. My understanding is, and I'm probably going to get this all wrong, so forgive me if I do, but there was a, a pastor that was going around to one of his um, congregation's house and there was a dusty old book, uh, The Murrow Controversy. Um, and over dinner, he just, you know, he said, I can have a look at this book and started thumbing through it. And it wasn't, in, it wasn't a well-known book at all. Um, but it was addressing um, antinomianism and legalism oh. about, oh, okay. you, you, you know, because obviously you can fall off both sides, can't you? And For um, sure. Sinclair Ferguson just done a great job of of bringing that back into people's awareness and 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 brought out this book and also done a teaching series through Ligonier about it as well. Um, but yeah, it's just it was just a real useful um, opportunity to marinate in the grace of God and just to know that we are saved, you know, by grace through faith and and just to swim in that whilst reading that book for a, you know, just done really really well. He's such oh, a great guy, nice. isn't he? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I love listening. And he's got a cool accent too. So, I mean, already he's got that, that bonus for us poor Americans with our boring mm-hmm. accents. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to link to that book as well down below, because that sounds really fascinating. There's so many cool books that you've mentioned on uh, here. I can't wait to link to all these really neat books uh, that you mentioned. I, I really uh, adore the idea that he was able to to balance those two things because they are difficult. Um, so we have some some fun questions coming up and obviously the one question that's very important that I have to ask you and I didn't even put it on your list because I assumed you knew that I was going to ask you this question Uh, nobody gets out of it I tried but um, so right now obviously we we know with your accent that you are in England what what is the spiritual um, temperature right now like over there I mean you guys are the country that gave us the prince of preachers so what is what is it like right now over there yeah I think it's really similar to you guys if I'm honest um I saw a quote from Justin Peters recently saying one of the most dangerous places a Christian can be right now is in a Christian bookshop um and it's just so sadly true I mean you know you think of my experiences to when I first become a Christian didn't know any better I went on to um iTunes and 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 source credibility from who the best-selling people are you go into the Christian bookshop or on Amazon you look at the bestsellers yeah. Um, and it's just shocking. Got some strange things going on over here. We've got um, you can really see the influence of a prosperity gospel. Where I don't think it's we haven't got anybody as bold as Kenneth Copeland and as <laughs> you know Benny Hinn, but you can certainly see the influence where people have got really bad discernment and they think these guys are sound, and then they you can see that they're influenced by watching them a lot and and. You can see that leak into how they teach, which is concerning because you can see also that people who are listening to it aren't discerning that well either. Um, yeah. We've got a really strange thing as well, Lauren, happening here where we've got this um, a push for an ecumenical interfaith, um, oh. weird um, thing going on. So basically, as an example, there's there's a push where there are not Christian denominations, so-called Christian denominations, um, opening up their churches to Muslims to come in and, and share prayer days with them um, wow. and to align and look for things that they have in common. Now, this isn't being done in an evangelical way to then bring them in and to tell, share the gospel and tell them about the exclusivity of Jesus. This is about come in 
and we will pray together to a, a God. I've got no idea who they're praying to. Wow. Um, and, and I just find it so bizarre. I mean, it's being framed as it's being done as a loving thing. I mean, how, how is that? Love, love, love tells the truth, right? Yeah, that's right. It's just not happening. It's just affirming people in their walk that, you know, we're cheering you on. We're, we're um, trying to be good neighbours. But also, you know, a way I I talk about it when I talk to people is the equivalent of having the, um, you know, the medicine for the coronavirus in your pocket, going to see somebody in a hospital who's got it and you could give it to them and make them feel better. But you go and see them, you know, feed them a few grapes and then go home again with the coronavirus still in your pocket, yeah. you, know, you know, with with their medicine. It's, it's just bizarre. I don't get it. And that kind of sums up the temperature here a little bit of, of, wow. of where we are. That is uh, a really great analogy. It's almost like the opposite of what Spurgeon said, where he said, if sinners be damned, let them, you know, let us be holding on to their ankles basically while they're on their way. But instead these guys are cheering them on yeah. their way. And that that's really sad to, to hear. We're going to be praying, um, obviously praying for your country. And I know that um, we, we have some similar issues here in different areas, but I don't think that we've seen quite that kind of ecumenism uh, happening that's really, really fascinating. In that same line of reasoning, do you guys have quite a few cults there? Like there's, is there Mormonism? You mentioned your mom was a Jehovah's Witness. Yeah. Um, is that a thing? Is that a thing that's a problem as well there? Yeah, it is. Um, so Jehovah's Witnesses have changed their tactics. They don't do so much door knocking now. They used to do a thing where they used to knock on people's doors a lot. Now they um, are reactive. They normally have like little stands on street corners and wait for people to go to them. Um but the, the, the real threat, to be honest, isn't isn't I wouldn't say, um, and I'm saying it's probably a little bit ignorantly because I don't know for sure the statistics. But the the, the push is coming from um, Islam in terms of, um, you know, Muslims. Um, I, I learned through doing the interview with Joel Richardson when a Jew rules a world, like things that aren't taught from a pulpit in England, like eschatology as an example, just isn't taught at all. Like, you know, 99.9% of Christians in this country would be quite ignorant as to what that end times all looks like, I, I think. Um, but Joel does a lot of work in the Middle East and, and, and has a, a ministry that's based out in Iraq. Um, and, you know, in a lot of these uh, mosques, but they're, they're laser focused on end times, their eschatology there is a mirror image of what the Christian eschatology is like from an antichrist point of view. When it actually yeah. mirrors up, it's bizarre how close these two things align. And they are taught what Christian eschatology is all the time. So if you was to ask somebody who is, you know, going to the mosque and learning a lot of time, they will know Christian eschatology a lot better than a lot of Christians. Wow. Um, so I think, and we see that being supported as well from, um, and again, it's, it's framed as being done in love, but, there's a, a great organisation in the UK called the Christian Concern, and they highlight a lot of these issues. And for an example, we're seeing Christian street preachers um, get shut down all the time. Some people make a complaint oh. saying they're saying something homophobic or whatever, and then they'll close them down quickly. But yet you go into central London, and you'll see tables set up, um, you know, with with um, Muslims giving out their literature everywhere in central London. Um, oh. Even the black flags, like the, the ISIS flags are out sometimes in these places and they're not squashed. Yeah, if you're a Christian standing up saying anything, it gets shut down straight away. So there's a real there's a real kind of um, momentum at the moment. And from a social media point of view as well, I think this is probably a worldwide thing. I don't think this is a UK thing, but we're noticing more and more with Exposit the Word. And I don't know if you've experienced this, Lauren, but you start posting around certain topics with, with your ministry. And I know you know, through expositive word. You mentioned earlier on, we've got 45,000 people on Facebook. We could do a post sometimes and we look in the statistics and it's actually got in like five people's news feeds <sighs> out of 45,000 people. That's and it's insane. Like we're just squashing it. Um, we, we had our Facebook um, ad account closed down for about three days the other day, just, just shut down for no reason. And I had to wow. send in my driving license and they gave no reason as to why. Um, I managed to get it back up again, praise the Lord. But um we just seeing that we're just seeing that more and more and i can see that kind of censorship happening on youtube and you know that's that's kind of where where the temperature is right now i think wow yeah we def i have noticed that for sure here um, in america we're having uh, an issue because elections are coming up and so if you're um 
leaning towards one way or the other, you're sort of being buried a little bit in the social media area. Um, so I've had to sort of encourage a few people that were like, my viewership is down by like 50%. I know, but it's probably all not coming from Facebook anymore, right? Because it's okay, yeah. elections will be over a little while, and they'll stop being uh, mean to us for no reason. But yeah. yeah, that it's really sad to see that that happening um, globally. It's sad in a way, but then at the same time, if you look through, you know, church history, we both know that um, persecution does tend to um, purify the church. And so in one way, it's difficult for the people living through it. But then in another way, we know that this is, this is going to be helpful. And God's, God's perfect providence is always, of course, helpful, but we will be praying for you guys over there. Um, That is really discouraging whenever you have another group out there and they're, they're preaching their own uh, false falsehood and then really interesting to learn that they know more about our eschatology than we do because I'm just starting to try to understand eschatology and it's confusing so that's pretty fascinating now brother um to get into a little bit of a lighter topic you have a very nice sweater on there and uh I just was going to mention I my shirt unfortunately did not get in time didn't get here in time I was really bummed about that but you have some really cool products in your store and you're wearing a cool sweater right now so can you tell us a little bit about your um, your products in your shop that you have, what they help with whenever people purchase stuff from there, and what's like your, your favorite thing that you have? Oh, thank you so much, Lauren. Well, if you like wearing unique clothes that nobody else is wearing, then get on board with Expositor <laughs> Word merchandise. <laughs> because in the last year, I think we've sold about 10 items. So oh, yeah. there's going to be no <laughs> one wearing what you're wearing if you go shopping. <laughs> to no one. <laughs> and I think I own eight of them. Um, <laughs> we... We um we basically just teamed up with Teespring. So when you when you get to a certain amount of subscribers on YouTube, it allows you to have like a little merchandise rail under the videos. So when we when we got the email saying that we can do that, we thought, ah, oh, why not? It's all print on demand. We basically just uploaded the logos and then they print them as people buy them. Um, I'd say this is probably my uh, favorite one because it's black, and I, I I was told that black makes you slimmer. Thank um, you. <laughs> so, slimmer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, it's amazing to open up conversations as well isn't it like i all of the clothes that i wear are obviously you know on most of the time ministry related and you know you never know how the lord's going to use that um we've tried to keep the price really low i think we've put six pounds commission i think it's about six pounds maybe five pounds commission on each item um whenever you buy something that five pounds goes completely on pay-per-click advertising on um, facebook so oh, wow. Um, and that, that's true of anything that anyone ever gives our ministry. We, we're really grateful to have had a couple of people that have, um, we've just signed up to, um, I think it's called Kofi, Kofi or Coffee. Um, and people can donate via the website and you, effectively you can buy a coffee to keep the ministry going. That's the idea that's behind so cool. it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we've had that going for about a month and we've been blessed for a couple of people to have put some stuff through there and really grateful for that. Because again, all of that money would just go straight onto Facebook pay-per-click advertising. Oh, that's so neat. That is really, what a cool way to do that too. I'm I'm so thankful that you have all these different options because I mean, it's awkward and really uncomfortable for me to ever mention to anybody that we have like Patreon and things like that, but I can tell people about my shirts all day and it doesn't bother me. So (laughs) it's great to have these different, these different options and and stuff like that. Cause then you kind of feel like you're maybe providing people with something, you know, but your shirts are funny. Like there's some on there that are like, like genuinely funny. So I can't wait for mine to get on, to get here. I think I I should have written it down, but I think I ordered the one that said um, about taking, I can do all things through Christ, including taking this Bible verse out of context or something Uh, like that. Yeah. I can do all things through a Bible verse taken out of context. Yes. I love that. I'm so excited about that one coming in. When it comes in, I'll make sure to uh, post pictures and stuff and, and there'll be a link for, for you listeners. If you want to check that out, because the store's got some really, really fun stuff. Lauren, you are Um, the only person that's ever bought that t-shirt. So you would literally be a one off. Yeah. For sure. Can't wait for it to get here. It's an exclusive. Now you have to stop selling it so that I can also I can just always have the only one. No, I'm just kidding. It's wonderful. I love I love that. I love getting to to get really weird, interesting shirts that are also scriptural. I've only had a problem with um, the RC Sproul quote where they people will say, "What do you mean, you people?" It's uh, about, yeah. I'm sorry. That's not what this verse. That's our, that's not what the quote means. I'm sorry, but um, that's the only one that I've seen that that I've had issue with. So I'm excited about that coming in. And are you uh, planning on doing any new designs or anything like that, or are you um, where it's at? Because there's there's really some 
very intelligently designed stuff in there. It's very funny, very clever. Oh, thank you. Well, yeah, I mean, if, if people ever buy them, then I guess well, I'll always keep them refreshed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I might do a summer, a summer range next year, but um, it seems pretty pointless making any more right now because I think we've got like 30 or 40 items in there that are just gathering <laughs> dust right now. But if, <laughs> but if people dust, ever like them, yeah. then we'll do it, yeah. Oh, that's so cool. That is great. Okay. Well, I do have one last question for you and then I will let you go because you obviously have, oh no, I have two questions for you. I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. I'm, you're not going anywhere. Okay. (laughs) I was just kidding. Um, so before we get to the important question, um, how can our listeners and viewers get a hold of you? Obviously I'm going to include a whole bunch of links down below, but what is your preferred method for them to contact you? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so subscribing to our YouTube channel would be really helpful. Um, (laughs) We've also, like you mentioned, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, um, Instagram. Um, we're on Parler now as well. You're on Parler, aren't you? Right? I am. Yeah, that's a really neat use. little app. Yeah, yeah. I'm still, I'm still learning how to use that, but we're on there, so you can find us on there <laughs> as well. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That'd be great. Yeah, Follow us on there. Absolutely. Okay, I'll make sure to put all those links down below. It's cool that they're coming out with some, some different apps like parlor where you can sort of have a little bit more free speech because we are seeing that pushback from from like facebook and, and twitter and stuff like that so parlor is pretty cool um i still also don't know really how to use it but i can click buttons and that's yeah. pretty much the only way i ended up with a podcast was i clicked a bunch <laughs> of buttons and somehow this happened yeah. so last question for you brother i really appreciate your time and depending on how well you answer this next question is depending on whether or not this interview will even be posted. Uh, do you <laughs> eat pineapple on pizza? Ah, uh, Lauren, <laughs> I know what you want me to say, but <laughs> which guests have you had that have said that they do? Has anyone ever admitted it before? No, no I'm just no kidding. <laughs> no, there has, there has been, there has been some really, um, actually Ray Comfort told me to repent uh, yeah. and that I needed to repent of not eating pineapple yeah. pizza. But then Phil Johnson said that eating pineapple on pizza is blasphemy. So he also said that he's never seen John MacArthur eat pineapple pizza. Really? Sorry about that. Well, I I basically will have anything apart from an anchovy on a pizza. (laughs) (laughs) That should be the real question. Do you like anchovies? That would be no, no, everyone would say no to that, right? Oh, look, you've even got a bug. If they if they didn't, um, there's nothing in here. I just like to pretend like there's something in here. So I can drink this whenever I'm dealing with people like you. Um, anchovies isn't they don't really put that on pizza, do they? I thought that was a joke. No, I think they do. I think, oh, I think no, they're really horrible. Is it really is it as bad as it sounds? They're oh salty. wow, they're salty and bony. I, I don't even think it's edible. Oh, it's like oh no. Yeah. Oh wow, it's like people who eat um, chocolate covered. Uh, grasshoppers and stuff just no Mm -mm. nope okay so we know to be praying for you then about the pineapple and pizza but you sent me the coolest picture i've ever seen i'm gonna play it um on friday's event so everybody already is gonna have seen this because this is gonna come out next monday but you sent me a picture of a squirrel holding a pineapple pizza that you created yourself and i i i absolutely adore this i i was i was literally out we were driving and so my husband's driving. He's used to this, thank goodness. But if I see a squirrel, if my daughter sees a squirrel as we're driving along, which is like every five seconds, we all we always go, oh my goodness, did you see that super cute squirrel? And he's trying not to like drive off the road when this is happening. But this yeah. time it was a cute squirrel on my phone because I was like, oh, look at this squirrel it's holding a pot of beans. It's the coolest thing ever. So thank you for making that and sending it to me and um, saying that it was legal for me to put it on shirts. So if I get sued, I can blame you. <laughs> Yeah, you're doing that on camera so <laughs> i'm just kidding i adore that and i really am so thankful for you joining me and giving me so much of your time thank you for all of the hard work that you have put into all of the stuff that you're doing on exposit the word brother it is a tremendous blessing to all of us we, we all appreciate for me and all of my listeners we appreciate all your hard work thank you so much for having me on lauren and thank you for everything that you do as well it's amazing absolutely brother it's nice to see you. you you too brother god bless you thank you have a great day thank you bye-bye like, okay, Humblebees, we can forgive him for liking pineapple on pizza because he made this super cool squirrel. Look at that. Can you, he made that. I was like, where did you find this? And he was like, oh, I made it. What? No, he said it in the cool accent. Oh, I made it. I should never do that. I'm sorry. I apologize. I, I can't do the cool accent unless I get angry and then my country accent comes out and then I'm all like yeehaw and stuff. So I should never, I should never mimic anybody else's except I always do that up here in North Dakota uh, because the North Dakota accent is really funny. And they're all like, 
Oh, for cute. Can I get you a big for that? Oh, oh, for funny. So that's how they talk up here. And it's really cute. But anyways, I really am so thankful for David joining me on the program today. If you guys have not already subscribed to his YouTube channel, follow him on Facebook and Parlor too. Very cool that he's on all those different things, Twitter, Instagram. Um, I will make sure to put all the links to that down below so that you guys can follow him and find all this stuff. Um, but make sure that you for sure scri- subscribe to YouTube. And uh, just remember, like he mentioned, that uh, it is actually a pushback against um, any of us that are uh, abolitionists in in nature. So if we are uh, against abortion, there is already that pushback against any of our any of our stuff and our content. And then being um, conservative uh, Christians, we, we're going to be push back for that. So it's encouraging and helpful whenever you guys subscribe and like and share. So if you guys can do that for his channel, it would be such a blessing. I know to him and a blessing to me and also check out his super cool shirts because they are really, really cool. And yeah, that, that is it. You guys, that's all I have for you. Humble bees. Hopefully you are having a wonderful week and I will see you on Friday. Bye. Thanks for listening. Humble bees. This is tulips and honey over now. I think that diamond still needs a little more polish. Yeah. Your cartoon thing is epic. I love those things. <laughs> Best, yeah, well, it's an improvement. If I could put a, uh, a cartoon on right now, I would, Lauren. <laughs> so, yeah, anyway, I'm so sorry to just already have squirrels. But the squirrel you sent me, where oh, did you find that? I made it. No I way. It. <gasps> Are so, you serious? I'm serious. So originally, that little squirrel was eating an acorn. And I managed to Photoshop in a, a Hawaiian pizza just for you, Lauren. No way. Are you serious? Because my stuff is usually here. And yeah. now it's not. <laughs> and my office is like full of boxes. But Speciality. Speciality? Or speci- <laughs> is that, is that, is that a word? That's okay. But the blooper reel needed something. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. That's a word in the UK. You guys don't know if I'm lying or not. So we'll just That's say right. it's a word. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this is why I never have. And also because I forget and I squirrel and I do something else before I can. Persecution. Persecution. I can say words.